My name is Ray Rybar and we're here to tell the story of how to turn dirt into Damascus. We're here out in Arizona doing something really extraordinary. We're on day one of our search for primarily iron ore. To get to where the iron is, we are going through the old billion dollar copper mining town of Jerome, Arizona. Lynx Creek pulled 183,000 ounces of gold a century ago. If we happen to find a flake of gold, that's wonderful. But what we're actually after is some iron ore that's already been crushed from rolling off of the hills and made its way down into this valley. Born in uh, 1949 in McKeesport, Pennsylvania, which was a steel town. One of the things that uh, I've always been curious about since the time that I was a kid and uh, on my father's side, all of the men worked in steel mills, is what were they doing? So it's a steel mill, what did they do? So I asked my dad and he explained it to me. However, in the particular place that I lived, I couldn't just walk out of the house into the yard and pick up what was iron ore. So as time went on, I began to study it and got more and more and more curious and asked more and more and more questions. I began to pick it up. My curiosity grew to the point where I was no longer satisfied at all with just a piece of steel that I saw made into something somewhere. I wanted my own steel, my steel that was made from nothing. So that's when and how it all began. We're here with Cabot Gun Company. Cabot is known for making the high, high, high-end 1911s. We're going to turn that ore into steel, then the company can begin their work. One of the reasons this is so special, usually the great blacksmiths, they work with steel that you procure and then you work from there. In this process, we're taking it a step backwards. We're actually going back and taking the elements from nature and then creating it from scratch. Here's the plan, gentlemen. Since we know that both products are here, the one which is the primary for us is the iron ore the FE-304. Possibly our little byproduct might be a flake of gold, Yahoo. That said, I'm going to give you a block of instruction how we will go about finding either one. Find a place in the water or even build a place with some rocks where you can set one bucket relatively flat. Get, get a little bit of water in it so that it doesn't float away and you're going to fill it all the way to the top. The reason I came here is because I checked, I knew that there was water. This is Arizona, most of the streams don't have water in them most of the year. This particular spot does. If we went to a dry wash where we could get some black sand, we would have to take all of the material back to the house to process it to see if we have any black sand or not. This makes life real easy because there's water here and we can process it quickly. Fan with holes in the bottom. Big holes, little holes. Little holes go down first. Big holes on top. The name of the game is 
to get down as deep as you can and hit bedrock where it's not been touched before. So if you can find rocks, little rocks that are tightly packed together and you see that those things have not been moved, they've put there by erosion and floods over the years. That's your best place to find black sand primarily or FE304 in our case, iron ore, and there also can, there may be or may not be, little flakes of gold mixed in with it because the heavies try to stick together. <clears throat> They're hard to get apart. That's why I gave you a screwdriver and that's why I made that little scoop for myself. You can see that I just used it about a week ago or so. And you can scoop out little crevices with the back of it. When rocks are so tight you can't pull them, you can hook them with this and pull it apart. You can use that like a screwdriver and wedge it. And it's just a Ford's railroad spike. You can't hurt it. So whatever you want to do with it, do it. And it'll help you. The screwdriver will help you pry little pieces apart. You can find a crevice, yahoo. Crevices are usually full of black sand and maybe even a little piece of gold. My name is Matt Dorito. I'm here with Cabot Guns. Uh, I've worked with Cabot Guns for probably about eight years now in different capacities. Uh, currently I work in their manufacturing facility in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Um, I'm here to learn more about the way that Damascus is made and uh, specifically to learn from one of the best on how to turn dirt and iron ore into Damascus. Being able to take ore directly from the ground and make it into different degrees of steel, whether it's high carbon, wrought iron, and traditional manners. Uh, didn't know it at the time, but that is a, a remarkable and very unique and very rare skill. Hey, my name's Chris Azor. I'm the president of Warwood Tool. And as a hobby of mine, I like to make knives. So a little bit of a blacksmithing background. I love making anything I can out of Damascus. So we've come down here. Um, Ray showed us a spot to look where there's a lot of iron ore and what we're looking for are chunks of that iron ore that have fallen down the hillside, broken up along the way, um, and fallen into the stream to where it's beaten up into a finer powder for us so we don't have to crush it up ourselves. What we're going to do, gentlemen, find a place for one pan to sit on a bit of an angle like that all we want is real fine black sand. It'll be down at the bottom of the bucket, but I'm not going to act like an idiot and not check everything since I'm here. I'm gonna put a good pile of dirt on there. And at this point, what I'm going to do with my other pan is fill this up and start to wash rocks. Rocks are clean. I don't want them in here, they're gone. I'm always gonna give a quick glance. There's nothing that says one of these can't be a big giant gold nugget. It's unlikely, but you never know. They've been found here, lots and lots of them, a hundred years ago. Okay, those rocks are nice and clean. There they are there. If there was a chunk of gold in here, you'd be able to spot it in a split second. It would show up there just like a uh, just like a gold coin, but I'm going to check it slow just to make sure. The name of this game is, gentlemen. Now that we have the rocks cleaned, the big rocks, and obviously um, we have them out of our way. Down at the bottom we have a lot of small what feels like mud but there's black sand in it. I'm gonna roll it slowly. If there's anything other there in there other than rocks, the black sand, anything in the black sand that might be of value is gonna be in that little ridge right against the edge. So what we've been doing for the past few hours we've been taking uh, the dirt from an area that we know is iron ore rich in content. 
we've taken that, put it in buckets, and then refined it. And so we put it through essentially a mining pan to get the really dark colored dirt that we think is iron ore rich. We spread it here over the rock and shortly we are going to be distinguishing what is dirt versus what could be magnetic iron ore uh, with a magnetic end. All of us have gotten a little bit of gold. I don't know if you can see that. But since we separated the gold out, what we have here is our target. Our target is this black sand and we have some on this rock. We're gonna collect it up and put it in this bucket so we can take it home and process it into high, some high value added commodities. There's the black sand that we want. One thing I learned in this whole process is if you're also looking for gold while you're sifting, um, there's a whole lot of technique to it. And those old movies you see guys with like uh, pans out in the river and stuff and it just looks like they're flipping and shaking and looking for gold to pop up. And it's not quite that easy. Well, we got what we need. So we are on our way out of here now. Everyone's packing up. We um, got a good surprise too. All of us actually left with a little bottle of some gold. Nothing too crazy. No one got an ounce, but um, we all got a couple flakes of gold. So that's a nice little treat on our way out. I do get to walk out of here today with a tiny little vial that's got a bunch of little grains of sand in it and a little flake of gold. So that's kind of a bonus, but we got what we came here for, which is a bunch of iron ore so we can start a process and, you know, work on uh, making a, a nice solid Damascus billet. Right behind me on the hillside is basically huge columns of iron ore coming up out of the ground and so massive. It's broken through the earth's crust and it's protruding up beyond, up beyond the surface. And with that information, we know that if we go to a lower area, we will find where the erosion has already ground that iron ore up. We could go up there and pick some iron ore, then crush it. Team A, come on up. Out of those three, that's bloomery steel. Pick one, any one. Okay, Team B. Matt, any one of those two that are left? You take it to a grinder first? Nope, don't do anything. <laughs> Team A, come on back up. Take one of those two, either one. And take either one of those double piles right there. Either one, doesn't matter. Don't lose them, you won't get any more. No, no, you Come on. You don't have a choice now, man. Got the leftovers. You got the leftovers. I like that. And I got the left of the leftovers. What we have here are a number of rocks. This rock is magnetite. Uh, if we were going to be technical about it, it would be Fe304, and since it's an oxide, it is magnetic. We have another rock here. 
and it is also iron ore. It is Fe203. It has uh, some sulfur in it. It is not magnetic. We can use it. We prefer to use this. Why? Because this gives us another step in our process. We want to eliminate as many steps as we can converting this from one product, which is a plain old rock, the only thing that we can use it in is a slingshot, uh, if we were to transform it or convert it. We could build an automobile, we could build a spoon. So regardless of what type of implement we are going to manufacture, we need a start. Our starting material is this simple rock. The easiest way for us to find some of this is to have a magnet and see if a magnet will stick to it and we're in good shape. Okay, what each of you gentlemen just picked up was the first one with some bloomery. That's uh, mid-range carbon. The second one, that button is high, 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 off the chart, off the chart carbon. We will be puddling that to bring the carbon content down. Then that last one that looks like almost store-bought steel, don't be fooled. You can see by the outside of it, I didn't do you much of a favor. I blocked it up a little bit, but it has to be stretched, folded, stretched, folded, re-stretched and stretched until it is qualifiable as a piece that will be able to turn into a tool or anything that you would want to say your name is on. So keep that in mind. And what we are going to do now is start a furnace and we are going to collect some of this, put it in the crucible, and rather than just sit around the fire and watch this thing come up to heat and twiddle our thumbs and talk about tomorrow, what we are going to do, that's why I gave you these, we're going to skip step number one, which will be puddling. We'll get to that. We will get to that, but we are going to step number two, that piece of bloomery iron that you have, not the good stuff, that'll be last. That bloomery, we are going to begin to forge. I'll give each of you a handle. We're gonna weld a handle on so it's easier to handle, no pun intended, and we'll begin to forge it. While we are forging that, the furnace will be coming up to heat the crucible will be coming up to heat and eventually we'll pour and we'll get another one of those buttons identical to what you have. Uh, if anybody boogers theirs up, which they shouldn't because I gave you explicit and exact instruction, there's no reason for any of you to make any mistake at all, right? Oh yeah, no, we've been here two hours. So that's, that's right. Easy. So no, no mistakes made, no pressure. And I'll keep the last button out of there. Now I'll give it to Rob. I'll let him make his decision out of what he wants to do with that last button out of there. But there's no reason for any of you to get it because there's no reason to have a follow up. on top here is metallurgical coke but I use it here because right here is and you don't want to stick your hand in there too close that's the coldest part of the fire as it reaches down and if you look underneath there's a fire pot that is like an upside down pyramid on the very top of that upside down pyramid is where this iron keeps coagulating because as it's drifting through here it is beginning to lose or transform it's beginning to lose its oxygen molecule as it loses that oxygen molecule the iron in it begins to melt and drip that's why the like that piece I handed to you it looks like wax dripping 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 into that clod this thing will look like a, a pile of wax only it'll be dark colored 
dripping. Uh, there will be a chunk of iron if everything goes according to Hoyle and Murphy doesn't intercede, and I don't think that he will, we'll get a chunk of iron out of there as opposed to just clinker. If it was just rock, if we just took the, see there's, there's a lot of rock in there. If we took just the rock, we would end up with nothing but clinkers. And you end up with some clinkers in coal. Since this is all iron, except for the little bit of rock, there's our rock. Here's our iron. This piece of bloomery that's spread out all over the place, I want to begin the process of getting it constructed into what will eventually, eventually look like a little ingot. So to do that, since it's spread all over the place like mushrooms growing on the ground, I want to start bending pieces in to the inside. What we are going to do is add some flux because the most important thing that that flux does, aside from those other two things, is brings the eutectic point down. Not only does it protect it, not only does it help dismiss some of the garbage that's in there, and you saw a lot of the garbage that's on this anvil that we swished away, more importantly to me is to bring that eutectic point down. The sides that were folded over, we forge welded them to the inside on the press. Now we're out of the press, we fluxed a little bit, we're going to fold it over a little and again, see if we can get a weld done on it. What I'm going to do now is check that crucible. I want to see what our temperature is there on the crucible. And what you've just seen me do, from here on out, it's like watching paint dry. I'm just going to keep doing the same thing over and over and over again until it gets solid. A simple bonfire is heat in a highly oxygenated iron uh, arena. What happens is the sulfur in this wants to attach to the oxygen that's in this area and it leaves. Once it leaves, believe it or not, this non-magnetic non rock will turn from a sulfide into an oxide and it will become magnetic. Now we can begin our process. We want that. We want to get the temperature so high that it's very, very loose. And then what is going to happen is, since we need something to get it at a high temperature, that's going to be a carbon product. Uh, that's something the tree huggers just can't comprehend. Why? I don't know. They hug trees. Gives us a great spot for our tree stands, but they can't comprehend that you have to burn something to get heat. It just doesn't register. So when you burn a, a, a product that is organic, it generates tremendous heat. That heat releases carbon. Oxygen loves carbon. Whenever the oxygen unites with the carbon, it leaves. That's what we want to do. We want to get the oxygen in the rock to unite with the carbon and leave. There are several different processes by which we can conduct that. We are going to do several of them during this week. The one that will be predominant will be starting right here. Just not too long ago, this was a rock. Right now, it is a pure, solid metallic. There is no oxygen left in it. As a matter of fact, we're going to have to add some oxygen to knock some of the carbon out. But that's we'll get to that. I'm getting ahead of myself. What are we going to do with the rock that we have? I'm going to take the B team out, set them up with their hammer. You're going to take your piece of sponge. You'll be in control of the welding instruction. If anyone needs it at all, 
to stay where you are. This is only going to take me one moment to do this little squeeze. I'm going to turn that forge off for a second uh, after I flux so I can give you a block of instruction on this hammer. Then I'm going to take the A-team in, give them a block of instruction on that hammer. We'll go from there. Same as inside, piece of newspaper. There's your tank right there. As a matter of fact, while I'm here, we'll light it. So we've just been given our first instruction here. Got to take this handle, attach it to this. So we got our strategy down here as far as how we're going to attach our handle. Um, sort of crude. We're just going to get in there with a big dirty stick welder. I haven't used one of these since I went to uh, welding school. So it's been big and, and uh, tank for me, but we're going to see if I can strike an arc without sticking right to it. billet looks like this. What we're going to do is we're going to cut it down the middle and fold it over on top of itself, basically like a sandwich. Alright, we're ready to take it out. We're going to fold it three times over itself and then we'll go back to the hammer and start drawing it out again. Getting ready to pull this billet out, and uh, we're gonna try to stretch it out now that we've we've gone through and put it in the press a few times and kind of squared it up a little bit, put some meat into it. We're gonna take it over to this hammer and uh, try to stretch it. We just got the fold completed, so now we're gonna draw it out a little bit, tap the sides to keep it square, and then hopefully draw it out a little more and get our next fold. Right now we're going to find out if we were successful or unsuccessful because this whole thing might be nothing but slag and we went a little too hot, or, or we cooked off all of the uh, liquid metallic that was in there. It vaporized around here and we have zero. If we did everything correct, there should be not a rock in the bottom of this, there should be a chunk of high carbon steel right down in this thing right here. So we'll find out. Any of you guys have a gun on you or rocks or rotten tomatoes, rotten eggs? I don't want to get shot egg to death or rotten tomatoes thrown at me. No, we'll no. find out what's in here. First thing we'll do is peek a little bit, see if we can push it over. Well, look at that. Oh. Aren't we happy campers? Awesome. Magic. There's the magic. There's the magic. That that's what makes a little third world country a premier top country. This is what we once were. That thing's hot, so don't pick it up. It is hot, hot, hot. That's as good as it gets. Well, there we have it. We started this morning, yesterday. Yesterday we went to collect our ore and we were successful and found some ore that had enough manganese in it and enough attributes, plenty of Fe, to be converted from that ore into a nice, clean, solid chunk of high, high carbon steel. There it is. Right there. Bravo, Ray. As long as you know what takes place, there's nothing to it. This will become the slide to a 1911 pistol.
Well, so today was a good day. We took our, you know, the bloomery piece that we had, we welded the tang to it, and then we heated that. We stretched it best we could till we folded it. After we got three folds in it, it started to stretch a lot better. Sure enough, getting, you know, more of a solid piece of steel, it's easier to work with. And uh, we stretched it a good bit, and then we kind of ran out of time, you know? But so tomorrow should be a good day. We'll be stretching it a little bit more, getting more folds in it, and then hopefully as we start to build a layer count, and draw it out we get a solid product that's you know going to stick together as one solid piece so this is definitely not my first time with ray and uh, you know at this point seeing this information now for the you know third time almost fourth time i've seen elements of it in different contexts i learn something new every single time i'm here and you know quite honestly there's only a few people that i know of that i could listen to for a week straight and ray's definitely one of them now we had uh, two teams here working and since we were producing this particular product today we have another product that we uh, manufactured called bloomery steel a little different process and we had two teams we had team A, team, team B, they were working together so that they could work more efficiently. This is a competition. I mean, I think our piece of steel is probably bigger than their piece of steel. So we got that going for us at least. Here's the thing, you help a guy out and you try to weld a handle on for him and the next thing you know, he's, he's rubbing the size of his billet in, you, in your face, you know? It's just not fair. Uh, working with my partner, Matt, and seeing him go through the processes for the first time just reminds me again, you know, to have those eyes of a novice. Uh, we're having a great first day, learning a lot, took a lot of notes, uh, a lot of the chemistry behind what we're doing here. I love the way that Ray's explaining things because having that foundational knowledge really translates to what you're what you're seeing and what you're doing, what the whole process is. I'm definitely one of those people that has to focus in on the why before I understand how to do something. So I uh, really like his style of teaching. Now what we did today, we started with iron ore that we collected from the bottom of a mountain yesterday. And the iron ore we converted today into genuine high carbon steel. With this high carbon steel, we will blend it with some other types and eventually have an ingot that will resemble Damascus steel in that it will have some stripes in it. It will have a pattern to it. And the bottom line is, since everyone had their eyes wide open, got to see every single bit of the process. Uh, no hocus pocus took the iron ore, plain old rock, plain old crushed rock, iron ore and converted it into this finished high value added product. Um, you can talk the talk, but this is walking the walk right here. Okay, this is the beginning of day three and we are making excellent progress and excellent time. did we end up with a successful crucible melt. We ended up with a successful sponge that we can then begin to turn into a billet. Now again, since Rob didn't bring with him a group of ducks, he brought some very talented individuals that know how to take orders and they know how to keep their mouths shut, listen to the orders, Follow those orders explicitly so that they have absolute success. <clears throat> this mass that looks like solidified sh shiny pile of snot eventually begins to form into a nice little billet. All of them were successful. All of them are coming along fine. Today, what we are going to do is develop the next part of the process 
and turn this high, high carbon ingot by puddling it into a malleable piece that will still be quite high in carbon, but malleable. Blend it with this and continue on with the process until we have a very qualifiable ingot that will be able to be manufactured into anything that we want. How's that going to take place? It's a puddling process. What is puddling? Uh, puddling is the process by which we can change the carbon amount in the product either up or down. Okay, now a little earlier I made the statement that even without spectrographic analysis or any other means of very expensive, highly technical apparatus, we can pretty much detect what type of metal we are dealing with, or at least what type of iron and or steel we are dealing with through a simple spark test. Very, very simple test so that we have a base. We need some base that we're all familiar with. What I grabbed first is this piece of broken cast iron pipe. And again, simple generic term, cast iron, because you can pour it and make a skillet. The fact is the carbon content is so high, it's off the chart. And just a reminder for us, that's a good point because it has a low boil point. We want to puddle this stuff. We want to puddle it which is a generic term, a puddler. We're going to boil it. We want to combine it and get rid of some of the uh, carbon in it to bring it down to where it's malleable. So here's what the spark will look like. You won't see much. I don't know if that's even visible on your camera because it is so low, low to no, you can't see much of a spark. Now that sets our basis so that we have some base product. Carbon content is off the chart. Now here is our product that came right out of the crucible. And again, it gained tremendous amount of carbon because that crucible is made out of graphite. The only thing that went in was that rock and flux. We need flux in there. This is what came out. Just about the same stuff. This is plain old pig iron from what once was the Homestead Works where they had a half a dozen blast furnaces set up. Basically, the same spark. Here's your next piece. Okay, this is that funny looking piece that is all bubbly because it was nice and smooth when it came out of the crucible. Now it's starting to be puddled, it's starting to boil. The carbon content is gonna change. <laughs> if we had a Japanese guy here that's wanting to make swords, he wants this right now, right right now. I hope you drop it. I hope you leave it out there in the grass. Uh, I hope you put it in my pocket. I hope you do anything with it. Here's another piece. All rough and crumbly on the outside. It looks bad. It's already been started to boil. Better than this one. This is already down to about um, 1.75 to 2% carbon. This one is down to about 1.10 to 1.50. This, this one is prima right here. We are going to lay down a bed of iron oxide or what most blacksmiths would simply call scale. We're going to put it in this little tray and each of us has a tray and you will see where the scale is actually converting into steel. 
again and has fused itself entirely to the bottom of that tray. And the bottom of the tray is getting thicker and thicker and thicker to where I'll have to just scrap it or I'll make a knife. I'll make a knife out of that little tray. That little tray is no more than a piece of box steel that I cut down the center to make that little tray. Um, there are more of them here. I have one for each of you. There's a brand new one right there. All it is is a box cut in half. Um, it's nice and clean. It's plain old 1018. Uh, one of you will get that. And we're going to put that crucible steel, high, high, high carbon steel, or what uh, most would call cast iron or pig iron, into this, and it will have this scale base, a couple, uh, about a half inch thick. And what's going to happen is oxygen is going to begin to leave this scale and hit the bottom side. At the same time, since everybody remembers our primary rule, the higher the carbon content, the lower mold, the mold temperature, you're actually going to see that chunk of steel will keep one pristine. We have enough, we have plenty. So uh, Rob has a nice pretty one in his pocket and you'd assume that that's a chunk of steel. It's never, can it boil? Oh yeah. Anything will boil. Water will boil. You can get anything to boil if you put enough heat to it. And since it is high in carbon, we only need about 1900 degrees, 2000 degrees. And this thing is going to start to bubble on top. And then it's going to start to uh, boil a little bit. And it's going to start to sink and spread out. When it starts to sink and spread out, it's going to be exposed to more oxygen that's coming out of this scale. And we're going to pull the tray out of the forge and just look at it for a moment. You might see some little sparks coming off it. What it is, it's, it's carbon leaving. What's happening, it's being exposed to oxygen. If I'm in a real hurry, we're not going to bother doing it here right now, but if I want to do it for myself and I need some quick, I want to wrap that oxyacetylene hose over there and leave the acetylene off, just put the oxygen on. As I'm pulling it out, I'm shooting oxygen all over it and shooting oxygen on it right here, and then I'll stick it back in. Whenever it looks to me like I may have changed from one carbon content to another, I'll allow it to cool down a little bit. After I've squeezed it, I'll squeeze it either with the uh, press or the hammer, usually with the press at first because I don't know exactly how molten it is or is not, and I don't want to put it in the hammer, hit it, and I have uh, hot shrapnel flying everywhere. So I'll put it under the press and give it a little squeeze. I'll let it cool down. You gentlemen will all let it cool down. And then, just like we did yesterday, we'll take this piece over to the grinder and check it. Where is the carbon content now?
basically what we did was we went through two rounds of puddling and when we squeezed that that uh, ingot down to a disc we spark tested it spark tested it's still too high in carbon so we needed to put it back in the problem is it was now expanded beyond the, the size of the shovel that we have so we didn't want it fusing to the walls of the shovel so what we did was we hit it to break it in half because we had water quench it we know it's really brittle we broke it in half folded it over stuck it back on the shovel we're going to bring that back up to heat squeeze it again then we're probably going to spark test it immediately and check took three tries forging it. First two times that we did the spark test, we weren't even close. And then all of a sudden here, this third time, we're perfect. So we're ready to move on. One of these marauders stole my piece, so I'm back at square one. Finders keepers. I'm, I'm tired of looking for it. I'm moving on. I have more to decarburize. I got plenty of material to work with. So whoever finds it's going to get ahead of the game quick. Wait, I can't keep seeing how he's coming through no matter what. <laughs> it sucks. I'll have you get power game. Chris, are you understanding? Stop that. This is yours, right? Go find the button. Wait, he found it already. Yeah, hell yeah, I'm looking for that button. What I did with it. Magic button. That's a big one. Could be anywhere. It's anyone's game. Yeah. They keep it. It's theirs. They get to add it into their billet. Yeah, we need it. We're making a sword. Someone help us. Uh, we have a way bigger, way longer final piece. So we get to make either a bigger knife or a longer sword. Matt, they find that billet yet? They have not found it yet. It could be our game still. You know, I've never been so excited to find a button. I know where it might be, so I'm going to just keep quiet and go and check. But I think it's closer to Team B than it was Team A, <clears throat> because I was playing, I was playing with those little spikes out here, and I may have laid it down. Yeah, these guys probably checked this area pretty good. Came into your house to look. Don't make me stand guard over this thing. <laughs> it's now or never. We gotta find that button. If we can find the bucket of those spikes. Now we're looking. Ray, we're looking for that top part to button again, to bubble again, right? Luckily, I was introduced to the American Bladesmith Society. They're recognized globally as the standard for forging blades to the point that even Queen Elizabeth's armorer. Uh, Jim Jackson, Jim Jackson, James Jackson had to come to Atlanta. Uh, along that uh, way, once I realized that the American Bladesmith Society was a very credible institution, I began to work toward uh, what they have and is known as a journeyman smith. To do that, you have to perform 
uh, several tasks with a finished blade to see if it will actually cut and if it will actually hold an edge. And, and then you have to present a board to a board of individuals who are master smiths way above what you uh, need to be these blades and see if you can acquire this journeyman smith rating which I was able to do and even though I had that journeyman smith rating I wanted to continue on to see if I could get the uh, uh, very difficult to get master rating from the American Bladesmith Society. I managed to do that in uh, 2001. Uh, since then, I've been gifted enough to be chosen by some of the older gentlemen there to help judge in the master uh, rating room where new masters would come in and present their wares present their best work, trying to get uh, a stamp that they could literally put on their blades. And um, that went for several years until uh, the man that selected me, and they don't want the same ones in there year after year after year, so it looks like some type of fix. Uh, an old paratrooper by the name of Bert Gaston, who was a master bladesmith in his own right, who just this past year, uh, and we're in 22, he just passed uh, last year, Burst Gaston was a very good friend of mine. When he stepped down from being the head of those that were judging in the master judging room, I was asked by a friend of his, Mike Williams, a master bladesmith in the American Bladesmith Society, would I come over and help judge in the journeyman room, which I did. After several years, Mike Williams uh, stepped down, not for any uh, derogatory reason, bad reasons at all. He had just been there for a long, long time. Age was starting to catch up with him. Uh, James Rodebaugh took his place as head in the journeyman uh, testing room and James Rodebaugh asked me if I would be willing to stay on there with Steve Swarzer in that uh, uh, judging room, and I did. So that's the small part that I play in the American Bladesmith Society. All right, we got a pretty good first forge weld. It's mostly set. We're gonna just tap it one more time, make sure, but all good so far. So this is the button that we pulled out of the crucible yesterday and uh, we put it in a few times, uh, tried to pull some of the carbon content out of it because it's got super, super high carbon and uh, we've done that about five, six times, put it in with some iron oxide, uh, pulled it out, pressed it, put it back in, pulled it out, pressed it. Now we're going to check, uh, do a little spark test on it, see where that carbon content lies and if we're happy with it. If we're happy with it, we'll move forward. Spark test. Looks great. My project was working well until these ne'er-do-wells behind me took my piece of crucible steel that had already been decarburized. Which one got it, I have no idea. But out of spite, I'm gonna catch up and pass them up.
Hey, gentlemen, guess what I just found in the water bucket? The one place that nobody looked. Oh, man. There it is. I dropped it in the water. Sucks. One to 20. You got one shot. What's the number? You guess right. Three. I'm going with uh, 15. One number. Nine. One number. 13. Okay, one person got it. Person got the three. Yay. Now, that That's team gets first choice. First shot. One question, one answer. Team B has the first shot because they got the number. Team A gets the second shot. Nobody gets the answer, it comes back to me. Who was the first civilization? to manufacture iron and steel and sell it as a high value added commodity to whomever they chose. <clears throat> Team B, you get the first answer. Is it depicted in that picture right up there? It's the Hittites. Are you asking me a question or are you gonna answer? <laughs> We're gonna answer. The Hittites. Okay, you guys get it. Good guess, guys. Good job. There it is. Did you know it was the Hittites? I did. I pointed to it and said it's, it's, it's on the wall. All right. I think we ought to cut this in <laughs> half and share it. You guys no, no. Did. Put it in you there. You want to do whatever yeah. you want. Cut it in half and share it. We're going to share it. All right. Well, that's really cool. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I wouldn't add it now. Okay. It's too far behind everything yeah. else. Yep. It'll never catch up. But whoever has it can begin another one at some point in time yep. when you get home, if we have enough time, whatever, whatever the case may right. be. But it is so far behind the rest of the stuff, I wouldn't add it at this point. Yeah. It was a really, really great day in the forge here. I'm tired because we've now spent two full days in the forge. We got all of our billets were able to stick, so we did probably, you know, eight or nine different forge welds and every one was successful. I could probably take this class five times over and learn something new every single time. I guarantee I could. I learn something new every time Ray speaks. Um, I learn something new every time, you know, we process this material. Every time that we were able to take a section of material and add it to what we already had, um, there's a little bit of anxiety there to see if, you know, if the forge weld's really gonna take, if it's, it's all gonna become one cohesive unit. And um, that's like the shining moment, really. 
uh, is when you pull that thing out and you press it for the first time and you see it just start to meld into one, one piece, stick it back in, you work it a few times and you see three pieces become one. It's really pretty magical. You know, I really just enjoy uh, understanding lost arts or arts that are so functionally rare that they're basically, they will be lost in time if people like Ray didn't pass on this knowledge. I feel incredi incredibly honored to be learning this, but also really, really sad that it's not common knowledge. Um, it's, it, there's just this underlying uh, sadness that, you know, there's a potential that this information could be lost at some point. Thank you, gentlemen. It's good to see you all here this morning on day four. And what we're going to do today is get ready to finish some of these billets into a product. It's a beautiful day today. You know, if all goes well, by lunchtime, we'll probably have our billet stretched out. We're at a point where our billets are about 90% complete. We're gonna take our billet, we're gonna refine it a little bit more. We're gonna put one more fold in it and uh, stretch it out. After lunch, we'll probably begin you know, working in the bevels and hopefully getting to the point where at the end of the day here, we've got a pretty serious blade. Okay, gentlemen, let's get to work. <laughs> I suppose I shouldn't say it, but facts are facts. It looks like these two guys, three there's away, they stole one of mine. I don't know how they found it, but they stole They stole one of mine because they have a nice liner, uh, high carbon and low, right across the top in a line. I don't, and they have another one across the top of the bottom. They have it on both sides and it matches on this side, all the way along, all the way along. So as long as they forge, I don't know how deep it is, but if they forge 90% of this, they'll be able to keep that and maintain it. All I can tell you is I'm nothing but a product of my coach, right? <laughs> That's what it's supposed to look like. I think Team B's got a couple of A players. Even though it's obviously a low layer count, and uh, if we had a, another week, you'd probably want to uh, fold this up and do it 20 more, 20 more times. However, since it is all homemade steel, the layer count is low. If you move it, you still have chatoyants. You shouldn't have chatoyants unless you get a real, a real high layer count. Mm -hmm. High, 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 high. Uh, because it's basically a reflection on a reflection. But whenever you have that type of steel, for whatever reason, you'd have to ask some physicist. Uh, I don't know the actual answer. I don't want to blow smoke up your tailpipe, but you get toyants on homemade steel for some reason. My guess is, and it's simply a guess, is you have other trace elements in there besides iron, iron and steel. Uh, that's why, consequently, if you take that throw it into Rob's blue tank, he's going to want to cut everybody's head off in the shop, starting with yours, because it'll pollute the blue tank. But if you put it in your own little blue tank all by itself, take it up to 265, 275, you'll get a plethora of colors. Some of them will even be translucent. <laughs> Now 
this is our semi finished billet of steel that may possibly one day be a uh, slide on a Cabot 1911. Right now it's just a piece of steel. I'm not quite satisfied with it yet. Uh, there are some things that it needs. <clears throat> maybe we'll do it tomorrow, maybe we'll do it at a later date. We'll just have to wait and see. But right now, I'm curious to kind of see what the skin looks like. Now, I have an ingot of steel here that is going to go at some point in time, or maybe not, to Cabot 1911 Manufacturing Company. However, it won't leave this shop until I am 100% satisfiable satisfied that it is qualifiable to the type of work that they are doing i've seen some of the work that they are doing it is far 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 above the standard of the gi issue uh, ithaca springfield remington colt 1911 that was made more than 100 years ago so before it leaves my shop it will be a piece of steel that I would want if I was going to make anything out of it for myself. So am I happy with the steel today? It's finished for today. Will it leave today? No, not until I'm satisfied with it 100%. Then possibly it can leave. Does it look like a piece of steel to anyone? Sure. Are there 50 knife makers that would like to take it and turn it into four or five nice blades? Absolutely. Would they have any problem with it? No. However, I'm not going to let it out of my hands until I'm 100% sure that it is to perfection. Matthew, how do you want to finish yours up? I've chosen the direction of uh, a more traditional blacksmith knife. Uh, I feel like it's really true to the process that we're doing right now, where a lot of the finishing techniques are going to be more blacksmithing techniques, uh, rather than taking a blade after the fact and making a handle to match it and doing some things and you know having to use some other machinery. I wanna do as much as I can here at Ray's shop to learn more about his processes and his techniques uh, to, to come to uh, a finished product. This is my very first attempt at any kind of a blade, uh, and I'm really excited to, you know, not, not only be learning from one of the best, uh, but like just to get my hands dirty and, and do it. That's what we're going to do with Matthew. In fact, we're not going to put scales on it. We're not going to put any type of wood or antler onto the tang part of it. He wants to be able to see every single part of what he's developed. So we are simply going to draw out some of that steel and turn it into a handle type. Similar to something like this, this is very, very crude. His is going to be much more refined than this and you'll get to see it at the end of the day.
Sam, how would you like to uh, finish out your solid piece of steel? What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take mine and forge it into a traditional Japanese tanto. Um, this process that we've gone through of uh, making our own handmade steel uh, is the Japanese term for that is Tommy Hagani steel. And um, basically in uh, sort of out of respect and honor for that tradition, what I'm gonna do is make a traditional Japanese tanto. Okay, we can do that. Uh, we have plenty of steel. Uh, your average tanto can be anywhere from uh, small eight inches long up to 12, 14 inches long. We have plenty of steel to do that. You guys ready to rock and roll? Ready? This will be the edge. Chris and Chris, A team. What are you gonna build? So my dad and I had talked about it, you know, last night we were saying maybe we split the piece up and we each make, you know, a matching set of tantos. Um, and then we ended up deciding, why don't we keep it together, maximize the length and go for a short sword. So that's where we got the idea to build out a Wakazashi. So I think all should go well. We've got a pretty good home forge set up. So we'll be able to make all the fittings and get the fit and finish right. So hopefully today we can forge it all out. And then we got a nice little coaching by Ray on how we'll get the heat treat and properly quench it and hopefully get a good curve. A rare occurrence, <clears throat> but whenever, whenever Cabot picks people, they pick good people. The rare occurrence is a father and its son that can work as a unit, a well-qualified team, and jointly they have decided to keep their piece as one and end up with one longer blade. A wakasashi is a Japanese term for a short blade. They're friends today. We'll find out at the end of the day whose wakasashi it is. And I might have to take back everything that I just said. It was a day of perfection. I have a large ingot uh, just about completed for a 1911 slide that Cabot may or may not use. We'll have to uh, finish it up and see how it looks and go from there. We're at the end of another day here. Uh, it's been actually a pretty great day. You know, it's been a blessing to be here with a master smith like Ray. Today we finished up the last little bit of our folding and forge welding. Um, which to me was, I think, one of the most crucial parts of this entire process. We finalized our billet. A guy like Ray doesn't really hand out compliments like candy. Ray actually gave us a great compliment. He said that it was as if we had uh, thrown ours out and stolen one of his billets. Both Sam and I took that as a, a huge compliment. Based on his reaction, I was just thrilled. 
You know, we started out with a rectangle of steel. It was probably, I don't know, six, seven inches, and now it's about 22 inches. I think everyone else in the class has at some point made a knife or a blade of some sort. Uh, this is my first one, so I had a lot to learn as far as uh, just how to shape it, how to move it, how to hit it right. And so we're, you know, ending the day with a pretty solid blade shape. Ray came in and he helped smooth out some of the kinks in our blade and it's, it looks really good now. So hopefully we're gonna hit it in the morning on the grinder and then if all goes well, we might get to the point where we can heat treat this and get some clay on there. I feel great. We're way ahead of the game. Um, there is a curve ball that I'm keeping hidden that there's a, a little side project that I'm gonna work on that nobody knows about except my partner, Matt and Ray. And um, if we can pull that off tomorrow, it's gonna be, it's gonna be great. Ray is a big fan of the Coal Forge, so of course, pretty much any excuse he could get to get us out of the you know, gas forge and out here into the Coal Forge, he took it, so uh, it worked well. We're all pretty dirty here now at the end of the day, but um, it's been a good learning experience running a Coal Forge. It's a lot harder and requires a lot more attention than just throwing it in the propane. Looking forward to wrapping this thing up and, and having a really cool piece to take home. As far as the stress level compared to some of these other days, it's really, really low. I think we're just gonna have a blast tomorrow and, and enjoy ourselves as we watch all of our hard work come to fruition. Okay, we're beginning uh, day five today, gentlemen. And uh, my only comment to all of you is, you've done absolutely excellent. I don't see how you could ask for anything more than to start with this stuff, which is no more than iron ore. And now on day five, all you gentlemen have to do is finish work. This one is, of course, it's pretty big, and they worked as a team. And the other team, they decided to go their own direction. Totally successful. Came out of that cup, out of the bucket that was the same stuff. Um, this is one of them. All it needs to be is finished. Later on, if you want to see what kind of spark comes off it, high carbon spark. It's a little over 1%, same as this one. This one's going to be a, uh, a folded handle, a wraparound handle. It will be finished today. And what they'll do is clean these up today, heat treat them. They'll do the quench, do the draw. They'll be ready to handle up. They'll be ready to go. <clears throat> the only one that's uh, <clears throat> sucking the hind one is me. Uh, <clears throat> this is a ingot right here that I started with and I still have a fold or two to go and a couple of pieces to add to it. But this part will slow them down a good bit. So today, we're there. We're basically there. We started with absolutely nothing and uh, we've got good product. We've got real good product and we can finish it out properly. We're good to go. I'm kind of glad I, that I chose the blade that I did because I'll be able to walk out of here with the finished product today. These other guys are gonna have some work ahead of them as far as finishing handles and, and doing some stuff outside of the class to bring it together. Their blades are gonna be good, done, finished, have an edge on them. Um, but this one will be, hopefully, by the end of the day, a uh, complete piece. All right, we're here on our final day. I'm getting the coal forge rolling. I've got a lot I need to do today. I'm gonna to be doing it mostly myself. So I'm actually gonna sacrifice work on my Tanto because I'm gonna focus on our kind of side project or little hidden project. My objective is to get a knife forged out of the extra piece of material that uh, my partner Matt and I forged into that billet. I'm gonna make that into a knife for Rob from Cabot Guns. I almost feel a little bit guilty that this was my first experience in any kind of knife making or Damascus making, blacksmithing, all of it, because I've really gotten the chance to work with uh, a, a guy who's one of the best to ever walk this planet.
now that um, I've been with the American Bladesmith Society for quite some time, and I've got to see a lot of newer and young people come in wanting to learn the trade, wanting to learn the, tr the craft, I can say specifically, those that choose to join that American Bladesmith Society, and I'm not saying this just to give them any kind of boost, it, and it's not biased. Uh, my answer is just on specifically what I've seen. Those that have done their research by whatever means into the American Bladesmith Society realize that it is not a fly-by-night organization and it is not easy to get either that journeyman stamp or that elusive master stamp. It is difficult. There is no politics involved. It is genuinely your talent and how far can you get with that talent. And if it is simply not there, they're simply going to tell you. So in that arena of the American Bladesmith Society, I see uh, students, young people that I like because they want to know everything. And not just about steel, they want to know everything in general. Uh, whether it has to do with religion, whether it has to do with politics, whether it has to do with what kind of shoe leather is that, and are those glued on soles or are those stitched? They want to know everything. And I enjoy that type of people and being around those type of people. On the other end of the spectrum, I do see individuals who watch, and it's a very entertaining program, Forged in Fire, and you can see them on there every week. I'm on Forged in Fire, and I learned two years ago how to be a top-notch bladesmith. Um, that's probably not the individual that I play with on a daily basis, because if they've got it all down pat in two years, they're so far above my pay grade that I can't relate because I've been doing it for 50 years and I'm still learning. I'm learning from different people, different things. So I see two different types. Um, I see the type that learn most of it playing some type of video game. And I see those types that are hooked up to the American Bladesmith Society and want to know everything. Ray gave me an option between two different handle designs. Uh, basically, we're gonna take this end and curl it up in a few ways to create its own handle. One of them has a sort of an S shape with a curly Q facing out. The other one has an S shape with the curly Q kind of facing in. And I chose an Audi. I think it looks cool. It's very aesthetically pleasing. have successfully completed all of our forging. So the profile is pretty close. We've got you know three or four spots where the curve isn't just quite right. But once we get that, we're gonna take the forge scale off, hopefully not find any cracks or anything devastating that would set us back. And if all goes well, we'll get a test etch done. We will heat treat the blade, get some clay on there. And then hopefully we'd be leaving here with a dirt to Damascus blade. So. If all goes well then, we'll be heading home, finish up the handle and just the last bit of finishing work, but hopefully we'll make some good progress today.
as you can tell, it's nearing the end of our last day here. Bundled up again and the sun's going down, so it's getting a little chilly here. All right, end of another day. We made a lot of progress. Uh, definitely the help of Ray that we are where we are. You know, as much as I thought I'd learn here, I learned so much more. So many different tips and tricks to all these different things that I thought I knew. And turns out either I didn't know it or I didn't know it anywhere near as well as I thought I did. But Ray's been awesome. So he showed us a lot and we've been able to get really far. We got all of the you know profiling done on our blade. We got it cleaned up. We got a pretty nice bevel here. So very good way to end the day. Uh, from yesterday to today, huge transformation. Matt and I ended up with our billet was big enough to, to carve into three sections. So today I focused entirely on forging that, that third blade. Uh, it came out perfectly. Uh, we took a, a very crude blade, formed the handle, which took me the better part of the morning to do. A lot of guidance from Ray as far as how to get the right bends, where to place them, how to, how to get the whole knife to fold up correctly onto itself. And then um, a lot of pro tips and, and just watching Ray work. My emphasis here was to learn a lot about the process, you know, from dirt to Damascus and how to forge it, how to puddle it, how to do all those things, fold it, forge weld it. So as far as the knife making portion of it, I kind of leaned heavy on Ray to put a nice edge on it and watched him through that process, just kind of trying to soak up stuff on the sideline was we all wanted to do something really special for our host uh, and kind of our, our leader here, you know, Rob Biankin from Cabot Guns. So what we did was we took a second piece of that, that steel that we made, which we knew was world-class, and we made a world-class knife out of it. So we forged an LR1, which is kind of a little recurve. Unfortunately, we just ran out of energy and time uh, for me to fully grind that and finish it and polish it by hand. So, you know, my buddy Rob's just gonna have to wait another few days till I can get it to my home shop and, and put the final touches to it. Preserving the, these industrial arts is incredibly important. It's a reminder of our history, our heritage, what this country was founded on, what modern day society looks like. The arts are, are very important and over the years, you know, I've been a beneficiary of people that have been really gracious in lending their experience, their knowledge, and I can't thank Ray enough for sharing this process with us, with sharing it with you. Everybody forgets things. That's just the way things are. So the importance of preserving it is shown, I think, over time. But then what happens is you look back someday and you say, wow, I wish I remembered that. You know, an analogy popped into my head earlier this week about how when you lose someone who's close to you, who's had a tremendous impact on your life, the best way to honor them is to reflect on the things that they've taught you. And that person con continues to live on through your words and your actions. And the same can be true for these industrial arts is when you take the time to learn how something's made, how something's done, even if it's not, you know, the, the, the way that the masses do it today, you go through those steps, you live it, you practice it, you learn more, you stay eager and hungry to learn more of that, uh, then we continue to keep those traditions alive with what we make. Uh, I think it's a testament to the great masters out there that want to inspire, uh, share knowledge for others to, you know, see that process and maybe adapt it and attempt it themselves. Uh, it's important that we maintain these arts and these crafts. This has been an unbelievable week here in Camp Verde with Ray Rybar. I am going to be like a kid on Christmas Eve waiting to see how this 1911 turns out. We, we leave here with a extraordinary responsibility to take this raw material and to let it express itself. Um, more than any 1911 that I've seen come through Cabot stores, uh, I'm, I'm invested in this one. I can't wait to see what it looks like. My name is Ray Rybar. I'm in Camp Verde, Arizona, here in my shop. And this week has been 
Dirt to Damascus.